All right, well, to the top of the hour. Looks like we've got a pretty good group here starting to grow. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it rolling so that we don't waste too much time with um, me and staff talking, but we get to the key parts, uh, the people that we wanna thank and um, welcome to this. Uh, this is our third in a four part series of webinars and uh, informational uh, offerings provided to you by Colorado Livestock Association. Uh, this week, I'd really like to extend a warm thank you and welcome to American Nationals, Clay Norrell and Liz. I'm going to butcher your last name, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, but big thanks to you both. Clay, uh, you got a couple of things you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks. Uh, once again, my name is Clay Norrell. I'm from Hotchkiss, Colorado. I'm a rancher and an agent with American National Insurance. Uh, we want to talk to you a little bit about our products here at American National. We provide a flexible farm package, allowing you to customize a policy to match your individual needs. We cover farm and ranch operations of all sizes, from the largest growers to the smallest family farms. American National serves the most common types of farming, which are cattle, equine, grain, fruit and vegetable, along with the more unusual ostriches, llamas, and aquaculture. Our local agents offer a one-stop shop for all insurance products, home, auto, commercial, commercial auto, business, umbrella, life insurance, and more. Um, today, I wanted to specifically highlight our livestock coverage that we offer. This will cover your livestock for perils such as attack by dogs, wild animals, accidental shooting, drowning, electrocution, flood, unloading, loading, fire, lightning, theft, and a few other common coverages. We can also endorse our livestock coverage with a freezing and smothering perils to protect your to protect you from losing your herd during a winter storm. Thanks again for the time. Hey, big thank you, Clay and Liz. We appreciate y'all making this possible, and we really appreciate you being a part of today's webinar. Um, it should be a very informative and uh, fruitful discussion today. So next, I want to kick it over to Kevin Paul. But first, I'd like to do a little introduction to Kevin, because uh, Kevin is no stranger to ag and definitely no stranger to the CLA team. Um, he worked with us as an attorney from Range Law and sponsored previously uh, to help fight the Senate Bill 87 uh, provisions that were going to take place back in 2020 that would have done pretty egregious uh, harm to the ag industry. Uh, and so having Kevin on board has been a really big asset. He's a Denver attorney um, and has been a part of a myriad of new and old things. Uh, he has been a friend to ag and I could go on for a very long time about Kevin because I'm very proud to have him a part of the ag community and um, doing what he's doing. But most importantly, he is currently helping us challenge the key service provider uh, provision and the Senate Bill 87 that uh, right now allows for trespass on your business property. And so without Kevin, we wouldn't be able to do what we're continuing to doing and in this fight. So Kevin, I'm gonna just go ahead and kick it over to you because I could brag about you all day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zach. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to get to work with the association. Um, thanks to Clay and Liz for sponsoring me today. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you for a bit. Um, let's just get started. We got a lot to talk about today. Um, I usually like to pick one or two topics um, to cover when I do a, a presentation for you all, but today we're gonna go a little differently. And we're gonna move through quite a bit of material um, because so much has changed in farm labor and employment law over about the past 18 months. We've been really busy uh, at the Capitol as well as, uh, as Zach was saying in, in uh, litigation. And um, we've been facing some challenges that uh, my firm never has before in our work with our friends in agriculture. And I wanna, wanna cover some of the things that we've been faced with. Um, we're gonna work at a fairly high level. Um, I can't really give you individualized legal advice in a Zoom call, um, 
but I do want to cover things that you're interested in. And so what we're gonna to try to do in order to make it possible for you to ask questions as we go through and things come up for you is to make the chat available for you. Uh, my colleague, Cindy Coleman, who works alongside me is taking care of that uh, this morning for us. And if you'll type your questions in, Cindy will try to answer them in real time. If there's a, a guidance document that we can send to you, we've got a bunch of those loaded up and ready to go. And if it's a question that uh, comes up for everybody, Cindy will just butt right in and ask me to answer it for, every, for everyone. So please make use of that if you like. Um, and uh, if we don't get to your question before the end, we'll try to get to it right before we go today. Um, we're gonna talk about these areas, wages and hours. There's been quite a bit of, of uh, change in state law in particular with respect to how you pay people and how you keep record of the hours that they work for you. We're gonna talk about working conditions. That's the stuff that really uh, was at the heart of SB uh, 87, the Senate bill from uh, the 2021 General Assembly that Zach referred to. I wanna make a couple of comments specifically about uh, the H2A program for those of you who uh, have experience with it and participate in it. Cindy and I have been doing quite a bit of work with some of your friends and colleagues who have had some problems with the H2A program. And we wanna make sure you know about those and know how you may can avoid being next. Um, we're gonna talk about paid leave programs here in Colorado. We've got new ways uh, that employees are entitled to take leave um, with pay from uh, their workplaces. And I want you to make sure you know what the rules are and how best to comply with them. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about labor organizing. That's something we've never had to talk about before. SB 87 um, made agriculture in Colorado, all agricultural employers and workplaces subject to what's called our Labor Peace Act. And that is the state law that permits employees to collectively bargain, to come together in what we call a collective bargaining unit, and then to ask an organization called a union to come in and represent them. I know you've heard about that kind of stuff, maybe have some strong feelings about it, um, but you've never had to deal with it as something that could actually affect your farm or your ranch in the way that we do now after SB 87. Um, I was laughing with a friend of mine the other evening about the work that I've done uh, with agriculture for a long time. We've always been able to say that in agriculture, the exception was the rule. Um, agricultural producers were largely accepted from most labor and employment regulations. Um, the, the federal stuff, like we all know, federal overtime in particular, and at the state level too, a lot of our state regulations did not apply to ranch and farm families. Uh, well, that's not the case anymore. Um, and one of the reasons I wanna talk to you is that you're gonna be confronting very quickly here some new things that you haven't, you haven't had to um, make a part of your business operations before. Um, SB 87, Senate Bill 87 that uh, Zach was referencing and that we all worked really hard on back in the 2021 session is now in effect. All parts of it are in effect. Some of it came uh, into effect on a timeline, but that, that timeline has now lapsed and all of the, the various pieces and parts of it are now uh, effective in our state. Um, one of the problems with SB 87, it was written by people who largely think that food comes from a grocery store. I know you're familiar with that problem. Um, it was also uh, written and advocated by people who didn't really understand that this is a workplace too, that people actually do work um, in a place that doesn't look like this. And unfortunately, uh, in a lot of ways, what Senate Bill 87 and the new rules and regulations that it, it imposes on our agricultural employers, the perspective it takes is that everybody works like me in a place that looks like this and not exactly taking into account the fact that you folks work in a totally different setting than uh, people like me and that sometimes imposing the very same rules on you that might be just fine for me and some of my clients that work here in downtown Denver uh, need to comply with just isn't a real good idea. Um, that being the case, we got to do something about this because as I said, all of these new things are now in place and are now effective and now are going to affect your business. Um, quite some time ago, about 12 years ago, um, my firm and I were asked by Dairy Farmers of America to help them and their members to deal with the fact that they were facing some pretty difficult workforce related problems. Most of them stemmed from 
the immigration issues that really affect the dairy industry. Um, we all know that dairy has unique, unique problems that really aren't solved by any of our immigration laws, things uh, like the H-2A program that doesn't apply to dairy because it's not a seasonal industry. Um, and uh, we, uh, we came in to help and ended up talking about our work as creating a culture of compliance. Now, that, that sounds kind of touchy-feely and weird, and it really isn't. It's just a way of bundling up three things, three components that I want you to think about throughout our conversation today. The first thing that's really important is you got to know the rules. Now, that may sound sort of simple and, and so like, yeah, right, um, but you'd be amazed uh, all throughout the industries that we work in, not, not just with agricultural employers, but a lot of employers don't actually know the rules that they're supposed to comply with because there's a lot of them. And so I'd encourage you, keep up with what's going on. Anytime that you have a chance to uh, attend a seminar or a conference uh, that has to deal with employment law, um, I would encourage you to do that. It changes a lot. It changes fast and it can change in some really important ways that um, if you're not keeping up with it, it can, it can really put you in a bad place. The second is you gotta comply with the rules. Please take this seriously. Not all the rules are the same size. There's some stuff that's more important than others and I'll try to point that out to you. Some things you can kind of work around the margins on and it's not gonna get you in a lot of trouble and other stuff that can actually get your business shut down in a way that it's hard to get you back up and running again. So um, I know that this isn't the kind of stuff you love to talk about and it's, and it's new and it's not something you've had to put up with before, but please do take it seriously because um, as some of the folks that we've represented over the past couple of years could tell you, it's no fun to have to call us up and ask, uh, ask us to help get you out of trouble instead of trying to keep you out of trouble. Um, and the last thing is one that's the most important to Cindy and me and the folks who do the work that we do. And that is, you have to remember that you may be called upon to prove that you complied. It's not just enough to know the rules and to be able to say that you did what you were supposed to. If you get challenged uh, as to whether you have done what you were supposed to do, we may have to prove that for you. And in the world that we work in, Cindy and me and other lawyers, um, the rule of thumb we work with is this, if it's written down, it happened, even if it didn't. The problem is, if it's not written down, it didn't happen, even if it did. Keep that in mind. We've run into some of the most difficult problems we've had to deal with simply because we didn't have any documentation with which to challenge the people who were saying that our client wasn't doing what they were supposed to do, even though we knew that they were. All right, let's start with wages and hours. That's the, the part of SB 87 that's really creating some of the most um, important and, and different changes uh, in the way that you'll be doing your business. As you know, Colorado minimum wage now applies to all agricultural employers, no matter how many employees you have. It used to be that you were only uh, required to comply if you met federal minimum wage requirements, the old 500 man hour uh, rule, uh, 500 man day rule, excuse me. And the, um, that's, that's not something to keep in mind anymore. Everybody in agriculture has to comply with Colorado minimum wage, which gets set every year according to the constitution uh, since 2016 and the ballot initiative that created a constitutional minimum wage. Um, for this year, it's $12.56 an hour. It's been proposed to go up to $13.65 an hour for 2023. That hasn't been accepted yet, but it probably will be. It goes up every year based on the consumer price index. So it's jumping a good bit this time because our rate of inflation is so high and the, and the consumer price index has gone up significantly. Um, so you need to pay attention to that every year because it's gonna change. Um, another thing that you have to pay attention to that come out of the regulations that are attached to SB 87, as well as some other requirements that apply to you too. You have record keeping obligations about your employees. And one of the most important ones is you have to keep record of how many hours the, your employees work on each work day. And I know that, uh, especially in dairy, who, uh, who I work with a lot, um, there's a tendency to pay workers on the basis of, of a shift. Um, and that's fine but they still have to keep a record of how many hours they work during that shift. Uh, it's a requirement, it's both a federal and a state requirement, um, and you can really wind up with problems 
uh, with your H2A folks. Now, one of the weird things is this doesn't have any exceptions to it. So for those of you who might have H2A range workers, this creates a special problem because we all know that the point of range work is on the federal side, you don't have to keep record of hours. Well, there's no exception in the Colorado um, rule that applies to agricultural employers for keeping these records. So if somebody is um, out on the range and they're on call 24 hours a day, we need to write that down, that they were on call 24 hours for that day because they were on the range. And I'll emphasize that when we get to the H2A part. You also have to make sure that you keep easily accessible statements that tell your employees how much they've earned, both in the pay period that they're in now and in every pay period during the year. And you need to keep those for three years. They have to show their year-to-date wages, their current period wages, all their deductions, and as we'll talk about in a little bit, um, also any leave that they have available to them, including the mandatory paid sick leave that all Colorado employees have access to now. Um, so watch that and be careful about it. This is the first place that I get to kind of harp on a pro some problems that we bumped into trying to defend folks in the livestock industry from allegations that they weren't, they weren't paying their employees correctly. And the problem we had is that we didn't have the records in order to demonstrate that the people who were raising that complaint were wrong. This is something that a lot of employers don't know and don't get right. Whenever somebody leaves your employment, you are required, if you are paying into the unemployment insurance program, so we know that um, if you're a small uh, agricultural employer and you don't meet that $20,000 threshold per quarter, um, that I assume you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, throw in a question and we'll answer it for you. Um, if, you are, if you are paying into our state unemployment insurance program, then when somebody leaves employment, whether it's your idea or theirs, it's not, it's not just uh, applicable to people you terminate. If they leave, you are required to provide them a notice that indicates how they can apply for unemployment insurance benefits. And just a, a session or two ago, the legislature added a new requirement to that that really threw people a loop. And that is you have to include a statement of why that employee is leaving. So if you terminated them because they kept missing work or because they were intoxicated uh, uh, on the ranch, um, you, you have to write that down on this notice of termination. Now it's, it's kind of a formulaic thing. It's not too difficult. But um, we're going to try to help the association out by making one for you that uh, Zach and Brittany uh, can uh, make available to you. So you can just kind of fill in the blanks and make sure that you're complying with this requirement. We'll try to get to that to them in the next couple of weeks so you don't have to come up with one yourself. The Department of Labor and Employment will eventually create one, but they haven't got to it yet. So we're on our own getting that done. Okay, if you've kind of been napping, um, this is the place to wake up because the overtime part of Senate Bill 87 and the rules that have now been adopted by the Department of Labor and Employment, what's called the Division of Labor Standards and Statistics, that's the place that's directed by Scott Moss that some of you are familiar with from working in the coalition that was trying to make Senate Bill 87 a little more reasonable. We didn't get very far with that. Um, but Director Moss was always willing to listen to us. Well, these are the rules that he's had to put in place now because he was directed to by that legislation. This is new stuff and we don't have much time. The clock is ticking. We're six days out, uh, six days and counting from the, app, the effective date for the overtime rule. And that is November the 1st, November the 1st, like next week. Um, so if you, haven't, if you haven't gotten yourself ready for this, uh, sit up particularly straight and take a listen because these requirements are going to go into place right away. For 2022, the rest of, of this year and all of next year, you will need to pay overtime to those of your employees who work more than 60 hours in a work week. More than 60 hours in a work week. Now, this really does mean week. A lot of times employers will mess up because they say, well, we pay on a two week pay period. So what we're gonna do is make sure nobody works more than 120 hours in any pay period and we should be okay, right? And the answer is 
No, that will not work. You have to keep records by work week. And if somebody works more than 60 hours in one week in your pay period and less than 60 hours in another week of your pay period, you don't get to put them together and, and, and add them all up. If they work more than 60 in one work week of seven days, then they're owed um, a time and a half for the hours over 60 that they work, not for all the hours that they work, but only for that 61, two, three, or four, however many extra hours beyond 60. Um, I hope that's really clear to everybody. If it's not, uh, tell me I need to go over it again um, in a note to Cindy. Okay, now what's going to happen is the overtime rule, the final overtime rule is getting phased in over a period of years. This is what Director Moss and the Department of Labor Standards and Statistics put in place to try to help agricultural employers get used to this because it's you've never done this before. So starting January 1, 2024, so after all of next year is over, the following year, we're gonna make a distinction between small agricultural employers and large agricultural employers. And it's based on how many employees you have and how much money you make. Small employers are gonna be those with less than four employees. So one, two, three, over the, as an average over the past three years. So we look back three years and we see if you average those three years together, you had less than four employees during each of those three years. So you're a pretty small ranching operation if that's the case. And your adjusted gross income that shows on your tax return has to be $1 million or less, $1 million or less. So if you tilt over a million bucks as your AGI, then you're not a small employer for purposes of overtime anymore starting in January, 2024. Now the benefit you get for being a small employer is that instead of 60 hours, your overtime threshold drops to 56 hours, which is better than what large employers get. What's going to happen is that over the course of these uh, four years that we're talking about, <clears throat> the, the, the threshold for overtime is going to go down so that employees who work less and less uh, hours over what we think of as sort of normal in agriculture are going to be entitled to overtime pay. There's this exception, which I'm just going to touch on because A, I don't think most of you are, are even close to highly seasonal employers, and B, the rule is almost impenetrable. It's so com complicated. It talks about finding a 20, at most 22 work week period during which you hire double the number of people you hire the rest of the year. So think about harvest. Um, time when you really, when, when fruit and veg people or row crop people can sometimes really, really increase their, their employee census. That's the period of time we're talking about. And if that, if they meet that test and a couple other things as well, um, then their threshold for overtime starting in 2025 is 56 hours for those 22 work weeks where they've got a whole bunch of people and 48 hours in a work week for the rest of the year. What I would suggest is if you fall into this category and you have questions about it, call me or call somebody else that you work with about HR and labor and employment issues, because it, it really is going to take a little bit of time to figure out how this might work for your ranch or your farm. Now, when we get to 20, uh, 2024, all right, so we know that all through the rest of 2022, starting next week, all through 2023, we're going to be at 60 hours. No matter how big we are, how much money we make, 60 hours is the overtime threshold. Then we get to 2024. And if you're a large employer, so we just talked about what the small guys are, less than four, less than a million dollars AGI. If you're bigger than that, then your overtime threshold starting in 2024 drops to 54 hours. And in 2025, everybody, large and small, goes to 48 hours which is just eight hours more than what everybody else, lawyers, doctors, uh, construction people, everybody else has as their threshold for overtime, okay? I know that's a lot of information and it's hard to get it on a Zoom call. If you need to call us up, um, please do. Um, we're glad to answer questions for you about your own particular circumstances, but I want you to make sure that the most important thing you get out of this is this goes into place next week. 
And you really do need to work with your payroll administrator, or if you do it in-house, make sure you're doing it right, that if your employees are entitled to overtime during this introductory period, um, you're getting it right. Okay, there's another way that you become eligible for overtime, and this is really important because it's different from federal overtime and from most states. We have a special rule in Colorado that if an employee works 12 hours or more per day or per shift, if the shift crosses days, the hours they work over 12, they're entitled to overtime, no matter how many hours they work in the week. So if somebody's been out sick for several days and they only work two, two days during the week, and one of those days they work 14 hours, and one of those days they work 15 hours. Well, that doesn't even add up close to 60, but that doesn't matter. The day that they, are out, they worked 14, they're entitled to two hours of overtime. The day they worked 15, they're entitled to three hours of overtime, no matter how many hours they worked in the work week. So please pay attention to this too, because oftentimes, um, when somebody doesn't show up or something goes wrong that you weren't inspect it, expecting on the farm, it, it, there's all kinds of reasons that people could have to work sometimes um, more than 12 hours in a day and they become entitled to overtime. Now, there's an exception to the overtime payment rule and here it is. If they work between 12 and 15 hours, so between one and three hours extra, then you can compensate them, not with money, but with an extra break. Now you remember that SB 87 requires that you start providing two 10 minute breaks if they're working a full shift plus their lunch break. Well, if, if you wanna avoid paying overtime in cash and the person is working one, two or three hours over, you can give them a paid 30 minute break toward the end of their shift. And then they can come back to work and you won't have to pay them time and a half. If they work as much as 15 hours in a single day or a single shift, then if they go beyond that, you have to pay them one hour at minimum wage. One hour at minimum wage, not per hour. Right now the rule says, so if, if they were to work 16 hours and you gave them a 30 minute break before the end of their shift, you would owe them one hour of, of minimum wage pay, which we already talked about being 13 bucks and change next year. Again, if that's confusing, please let us know. I'll be glad to go back over it. <clears throat> now, there's one exception that's specifically for agriculture from overtime eligibility. It's very similar to the exceptions that all other employers um, have available to them. You may have heard of them called the professional, executive, and administrative exceptions. Those usually don't apply to folks in agriculture because you don't do the kind of job duties that we do here in an office. Um, but there is a new uh, exception, it, and it depends on the salary that the person gets paid and their job duties. Let's start with the salary. For 2022, you have to pay that person $865.38 per week which equals $45,000 a year in order to gain the, um, access to this exception. And that amount, like everything else, is gonna go up per year to 961.54 in 2023. And it, I think it's to about $1,000 in 2024. So that has to be the employee's salary per week or we can't even get on to what they do. If you meet that standard, and I know some of you have folks who've been with you forever, who are your, your supervisors, superintendents, lead folks that you pay really good and they, they make a lot more than these thresholds, then you look at what they do. And here's the test. First of all, they have to be full-time and work with livestock as their primary business, their primary business duty. All right, so they're not just a couple of days every now and again helping with the herd. That's their job to work with your livestock. They have to have a job that requires them to, to exercise independent judgment and discretion. And this is just, this is a phrase that we use in employment law all the time and um, to describe overtime exemptions. So it's nothing special. It just means that they don't just do what you tell them to do. Um, they, you ask them to go do a job and then they have to figure out how to do it. And most of the time it's because they're managing people and figuring out how they do it. 
they have to either manage at least two full-time equivalents. So at least two full-time people, or if you have part-time people, enough part-time people that they would equal two FTEs, or they report directly to you as the owner, um, uh, or they, they report to the person who's your second in command, your lead person, an executive that works right alongside you, all right? So full-time livestock work, independent judgment and discretion. They got to manage a couple of guys or they got to report directly to you. So they're, they're high-level supervisory people. If they meet those thresholds of salary, then they are not entitled to overtime. You still need to count the number of hours that they're working per day in, in case we get in trouble. They need to keep their, they need to keep their hours, but they're going to be exempt from getting paid overtime or being entitled to an extra break or being entitled to a lump sum payment of minimum wage when they work more than 15 hours. I know that was a whole bunch of information in a very short period of time. We're pretty much done with the overtime rule. And the worst thing I have to tell you is it may all change. Very shortly after the overtime rule was adopted by Director Moss and published, a group of folks who are advocates for um, farm workers, um, as well as a couple of individuals sued the state on the ground that the overtime rule is unlawful and that the state cannot come up with an agriculture specific overtime rule. The only way the state is permitted to do this is to make farms and ranches um, and greenhouses and other folks who are agricultural employers subject to a 40 hour work week, 12 hour day overtime rule, no exceptions. That lawsuit is, is not very far along. The state's first effort called a motion to dismiss to get rid of it was denied by the Denver District Court. So now it's gonna proceed on to the next phases of the case. Um, we'll keep an eye on it. I know you will too. Um, it's probably not gonna be over for at least a year. So please don't think that the fact that it's been challenged means that you don't have to comply. You do. These rules are now gonna go into effect and you need to, you need to follow them until something changes about the overtime rule. Okay, now let's move on to the topic of working conditions. Um, and this really implicates the, the middle part of, um, SB2, of SB 87, for those of you who were part of the kind of negotiations on that, mostly being told what horrible people we were to be opposing it. Um, as uh, uh, Zach mentioned, the key service provider access provisions are important to know about. That's the provision in the bill that says that any service provider an employee may need access to, and it doesn't have any more specific definition of service provider than that, you cannot interfere with in any location. In, if they want to visit with an employee, they're entitled to do it. That includes on your property. And now the state in, in some litigation that we filed is taking the position that, oh no, it doesn't mean that it's more narrow than that. But I, you can't read it that way. And I don't think that that's going to work for them. Um, the fact is, this is in force now. We've had experience, including with some of the folks from the association, uh, with uh, people, especially people who say that they are providers of educational services, and they want to talk to the employees about English as a second language classes and things of that sort, come onto the property and demand to be able to go visit with people. Now, remember, in addition to the key access service provider provision, there's another completely separate provision that says that your employees who are housed on your property have a right to have visitors come to their property, to the, to the place where they live without you interfering with them. That we have not been able to challenge in the litigation because there, there's no law that would support us stopping that because in that instance, you're treated as a landlord and the employee is treated as a tenant. And tenants do have a property interest in the, the property where they reside. And in general, outside of reasonable safety rules, um, they can invite people to come visit with them. Um, and so you can't bar people from doing that. What we're worried about is people coming on to the other parts of your property, well apart from where the tenants reside, um, or if you don't have any uh, workers who are uh, tenants and residing on your property, um, we have asserted in the litigation that's noted on the bottom of the slide, it's called Talbot's Mountain Gold 
That's a company run by Bruce Talbot from over at Palisade with the Great Peaches um, and a group of other um, <clears throat> a group of other folks, including um, Audrey Rock and her uh, uh, cattle operation in Buffalo Ranch uh, over toward the southeast. Um, and uh, we tried to cover the state with the plaintiffs. So we cover all sectors and all different um, disciplines in agriculture. We have filed a lawsuit against the state arguing that the key service provider access provision is unconstitutional and can't be enforced. Um, we're uh, at the early stage of that lawsuit too. We filed a, a motion asking the court to, the word is enjoin the law from being, um, from being imposed and enforced by the state. Um, the state has responded to us. We're in the process of replying to the state's response. That'll be done in about a week. And then the case will be ready for the judge to rule on. And if we get a positive ruling, we're gonna be really happy at that early stage. We may have to go further in the case though to get that done. Keep in mind that just because we filed a lawsuit and asked that the court hold this thing off, that doesn't mean you, you don't need to comply with it now, you do. And so please do. Um, also, if you have people come onto your property, give uh, Zach or Brittany a, a call or an email because we're trying to keep track of how often this is actually taking place. That's helpful to us and they can get that information to us. You know too, SB 87 has a transportation policy that requires that for people who are working on your ranch and um, that live on your ranch, you need to provide them a trip to town at least once a week um, if they don't have their own transportation available to them on the ranch. Um, and if you have range employees, that, that period extends out to once every three weeks. Um, we've already been through a situation where um, one of our clients has been challenged on their compliance with this policy based upon a, what we believe is a fictitious complaint that they weren't. And one of the things that's helping us is we have a written policy in place, a transportation policy. Um, I don't remember if the one we've created at our firm has made it to the uh, CLA yet. If it hasn't, Zach will let me know and we can help you uh, to put that in place um, because you need to have it posted. And we also recommend that you actually give that transportation to employees and have them sign off on it. Why? So that when you get challenged, I can prove that you did the right thing. All right, H2A stuff. We've seen this weird new thing called a discontinuation of services. Most people think that the H2A program is a federal program. And it's true, the Federal Department of Labor has a lot to do with it, but it is a joint program with the state, Department of Labor and Employment, and the Division of Employment and Training. And what the state has done in one instance that we've been working on has come in and said that the H2A um, agricultural producer violated the terms of its work contract and therefore the state workforce agency, which is the, the, the division of employment and training, will no longer work with that agricultural producer. Well, that means they can't get their property inspected. That means the state agency won't sign off on their contracts, on the terms and conditions of employment. They're basically out of H2A if that happens. There's an appellate process for the complaint that was filed that we've been pursuing. We think we're gonna succeed in fixing the problem, but it is not something you wanna go through. If you have H2A employees, please, please read every word of that form 79790A, the big application that you file, the job order app, please read every word and then read it again. And that's because when you get to the last page and you sign, that application, that job order, it says, I declare under pains and penalties of perjury that I have read and reviewed every page of this form. And the government means it. And we are, we are having to really, really work hard, uh, which gets expensive uh, to, in order to work around the fact that our client was not necessarily aware of everything that got into the 790A and into the work contracts. I know we all have a tendency to look at something and say, oh yeah, I've seen this before. It all looks good and sign off on it. Please, this is really important. If you say you're gonna do something in that 790A, you need to know it so that you're sure that you're doing it. And it is not a defense to say that you used a recruiting firm 
or somebody else to help you do it. You and your business are ultimately completely responsible for what goes into the job order and what goes into the work contracts. Um, and it, it, it won't help to, to sort of point the finger at somebody who helped you do this. Um, and actually, some of those recruiting firms don't know jack about Colorado labor and employment law and, and did, are not bothering to, um, to gain an understanding of it and are putting stuff in the job orders that, that they should not be putting there and that are putting our clients at risk of having to com comply with uh, requirements that are completely contradictory to one another and they can't do. So I don't mean to beat a dead horse, but this is really important stuff because I know how important H2A can be to ranches. And um, you, the, the, the big hammer in this is they can keep you out of the H2A program if they want to. All right, um, remember you have to prove it. Uh, <laughs> This is a problem that we came up uh, we came up against with some of our H2A clients as well. Um, you know the rule that if you are going to uh, characterize somebody not as a general ranch worker but as a range worker, they have to work pr their primary work and most of their time, at least fifty percent, has to be spent herding and in the production of livestock on the range or in work closely and directly related to that. They can't be up by the ranch at ranch headquarters, driving a tractor, plowing a road or something like that. Well, you know that rule and you comply with that rule. They're H2A range workers. So the federal government has told you, you don't have to keep track of their hours. But what do you do when somebody comes to you like Colorado Legal Services and says, my guy says, that's not what he did working on your ranch. In fact, he worked 75% of his time doing stuff around headquarters and very rarely worked with the livestock. What do we do? I have you hold up your hand and swear that that's not true, but that won't get us there. We have to have the documentation. And so it's an H2A requirement that most of you probably know that you have to document every day that a, an employee, an H2A range worker is working on the range. Remember I tied back to say, you want to keep a time record that says they were on call 24 hours that day. Why? Because they were working on the range. And when we get that challenge that that person wasn't working on the range, we're going to pull out the piece of paper that you signed and the employee signed saying, yep, I agree. That was my schedule. Please take that seriously. It gets to be a hellacious mess when we can't uh, prove the hours that people worked with documentation that they already agreed to. Paid leave, this is Colorado stuff. You know about the Colorado Healthy Families and Workplaces Act. This went into place in 2020, became effective in 21 and 22. It's now effective for all employers. There used to be an, a, a, a year long exception for small employers under 10. That's not the case anymore. It applies to everybody. Here's what it requires. Paid sick leave for each employee and paid public health emergency leave. Let's talk about both of those because there are no exceptions anymore for employers and there's certainly no agricultural exception to it. Paid sick leave is this, the employee earns one hour of paid sick leave for every 30 hours that employee works. If the employee is an overtime exempt employee who gets a salary, so remember that exception for the, the supervisor who works with livestock on your ranch and is like your second in command, that person may not be, <clears throat> may not, it doesn't have to accrue at one hour for every 30 because they may work a lot more than 30 hours. You presume that they work 40 hours a week, even if they don't work that many or if they work a lot more. You just presume that it's 40 hours a week. But for almost all your employees, you're going to be counting one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours they work to a maximum of 48 hours a year. That's the most that any employee can accrue in a year and the most they can use in a year. What we have recommended to our employers after two years of more than two years of experience with this is instead of doing an accrual where you're counting as you go along, especially with employees who work well more than 30 hours every week, um, just front load 48 hours of sick leave. On January 1, every employee has 48 hours of sick leave to use if they get hurt or if they get sick or if they have to take care of a sick child or, or relative. 
Um, it's a lot easier administratively because you have to keep track of this. Even if you have a PTO program um, that where you want to integrate this with the PTO program, you still have to keep record of how much of that time is used as sick leave. So after we've tried a whole bunch of different things with our employer clients, we finally settled on saying the easiest thing to do and the thing you're least likely to make a mistake about is just have a sick leave program. And for everybody that works full time, they get 48 hours uh, of sick leave during the year. Um, and uh, I hate to tell you, but for my purposes, COVID ain't over yet. Um, public health emergency leave is what we call COVID leave. It's specifically for people who come down with coronavirus disease, who have to take care of a family member or a child who comes down with coronavirus disease, or God forbid, the schools are, and childcare places are closed again because we have another surge of COVID. That is still in place. That public health emergency order from the federal government was renewed um, this month and it stays in place until into 2023. Now, we don't know what's gonna happen then. A lot of that's gonna depend on how the disease progresses um, over the course of this next quarter of a year or so. But for right now, public health emergency is still in, leave, in place. That's the leave that requires 80 hours, 80 hours of leave for all your full-time employees for these COVID-related issues. Um, if you hire somebody tomorrow, even though it feels like the coronavirus has really lightened up and isn't causing us anywhere near as much trouble, they still get access to 80 hours of leave if they have a problem related to coronavirus disease. And this access to, to public health emergency leave extends until four weeks after the public health emergency order is rescinded. You'll know when the public health emergency order is rescinded because we're gonna send something to Zach um, saying it has been, and it's gonna be all over the newspapers and the television and you'll know about it. But that doesn't mean that the leave is over right then. If somebody still comes down with uh, COVID-19 symptoms or test is po tests positive, or they have to take care of a child, for instance, um, who has tested positive for the, for the disease, they still have access to that 80 hours uh, of coronavirus-related uh, leave. Um, do keep in mind, it's only 80 hours. It doesn't renew every year. Once they use it, it's gone. So if you have employees who used their 80 hours of coronavirus leave um, back during 2021 or even earlier this year, it's gone. They don't get any more of it. And you're, you're done with that for that employee. So it's, it's a one and done stuff. Um, paid sick, sick leave and uh, public health emergency leave do not have to be paid out at the termination of employment, okay? Keep that in mind that um, even though the, the uh, COVID leave, the PHE leave of 80 hours is still in place, when it ends, you don't owe people 80 hours worth of leave if they didn't use it. It just evaporates and goes away. The same with Healthy Families and Workplaces Act leave. People get that 48 hours. Um, if they don't use the 48 hours and they leave your employment, they don't get paid that 48 hours in cash. Now, please remember that in order to be in compliance with Healthy Families and Workplaces Act, you have to have a written policy that tells employees how you are gonna deal with their paid sick leave. Um, and uh, you also have to have a poster up that talks about Healthy Families and Workplaces Act and their access to it. The other place, that you need to put, you, you would be best to add reference to how much sick leave the employee has available and has used is on their paycheck stub. You don't have to do that, but it's the easiest way to do it. And for those of you who use computerized the uh, software-based um, uh, tools to generate paychecks with, almost all of them have uh, 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 the ability to manipulate it, to add leave um, to the paycheck stub. And that, that's one of the best ways to make sure that you can demonstrate that you were telling the employees how much leave they had available and how much leave they had, they had used um, during the course of the year. There are all kinds of other posters that you're required to put up too. There's a new one 
on the Department of Labor and Employment, Division of Land, Labor Standards and Statistics website that I bet you're all familiar with um, that just came out with respect to the agricultural um, requirements under SB 87. They had been a little slow getting those out. So that's where you need to go to access those posters. There's a, a spot on the website that tells you all the posters you're supposed to have up. It's not just one. We tell uh, all of our farm families, go to the Home Depot or go to the Office Depot and get one of the big bulletin boards, like the 48 by 36 ones. That's probably big enough to hold all the posters that you're supposed to have up. I swear to you, if you get audited, they will come in and they will ding you and they will fine you for not having the posters up and available to your employees. So they need to be in a place where they congregate and, and you need to have them all up. There are federal posters you also are required to have up about workplace safety, about minimum wage, um, and about any discrimination issues. So um, please, if you, if you need help with that, maybe... Um, Maybe let Zach know and we, we will, we'll send over some resources for you so you can find where they are. You never need to respond to those ads you get that say for just $300, they'll send you a poster for your state. These are all free. They can be printed on a home printer. They come off on letter or legal size paper. And you just need to make sure that you check every year that you've printed them off and you've got them up. It's one of the easiest compliance tools that you have. And it shows that you're paying attention to what your obligations are. Hi, Kevin, this is Cindy. I wanna interrupt for just a minute with a couple of questions. We're getting a lot of questions about how these um, regulations and laws you're describing apply to H2A workers. Huh? And then we also have some questions about whether or not, um, what the impact is November 1, if you use multiple LLCs to pay your employees. Uh, are those questions clear? Start with the H2A one first. The answer is all of them. Um, for instance, our um, what's called the COMS order, the Colorado Minimum Pay Standards, Overtime and Minimum Paid Standards order, it defines a minimum wage for H2A range workers. Otherwise, the minimum wage that applies to H H2A general ranch workers is our general minimum wage. And you know, if that minimum wage is higher than the adverse effect uh, uh, wage rate, then H2A requires that you pay the minimum wage. Um, so there's, there's virtually nothing that I've talked about that isn't applicable to folks who are working under the H2A program. One of the things that you attest to in your 970A is that you're going to comply with all applicable federal and state laws. So there, there really isn't anything I've talked about, including paid sick leave, um, that um, does not apply to the H2A folks. Um, then, uh, with, uh, ask me the other question again real quick, Send. Took me a moment to find mute. Um, the other question relates to what, if on, what happens if on November 1st, when you have to figure out how many employees you have, where you fit, if you have, you're paying employees through multiple LLCs? Got it. So the employee is going to be attached to the EIN from which that employee receives their pay. That's the, the EIN is the number that goes on the W-2, for instance, the W-4. That's the entity that that employee is paid by. And right now, um, that's how you would count them. Um, we don't have a rule yet that, the, that says if all of the LLCs have common ownership, um, that you have to aggregate the employees. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens, um, but uh, the, the, the answer to your question is if you have multiple LLCs, those LLCs each have employees under their EIN, then the LLC that is, that's paying the employee is going to be the one that you're, you're worried with. Okay, back to leave. And um, we're going to have a little bit of time at the end. I was trying to make that happen. So if I didn't answer a question clearly, pop back up and I'll do a better job. In addition to healthy families and workplaces leave, make sure you got that. In addition to healthy families and workplaces leave, we are going to implement the Colorado Family Leave Program here shortly. Family stands for Family and Medical Leave Insurance. 
It is for people to deal with a serious health condition for themselves, like a serious illness or a serious injury, taking care of a family member who is seriously ill or injured, or taking care of a new child, whether adopted or a foster child or a biologic child. The way the program works is it's very similar to unemployment insurance benefits. People are gonna, employers and employees are gonna pay into a state fund that's gonna function kind of like unemployment does where when you're eligible for it, you get a percentage of your normal rate of pay. Not the full thing, but a percentage of that. So the formula that the Department of Labor Employment has adopted is that every year 0.9%, so nine tenths of a percent of each employee's wages will be contributed. And it's gonna be shared half and half, 0.45 by the employer, 0.45 by the employee, except for employers who have less than 10 employees, less than 10 employees, so one through nine. One through nine, your job is only to transmit the employee person, portion, which comes out, it's like after tax, that's, that's contributed by the employee from their gross salary, and you are not required to contribute as an employer. That's the way the rule is now. That doesn't mean it won't change later on if they don't have enough money to do what they want to do. But right now, if you're a small employer under 10, you're not going to have a contribution requirement yourself. This is going to start January 1st of 2023. It's going to start with contributions only. So if you're more than 10 employees, you're going to start contributing on your behalf and on the employee's behalf to the pool, to the state fund beginning in 2023. That's to allow us to build up the pot that we're then gonna start paying benefits from in January of 2024. Theoretically speaking, there's a lot of people who don't think that the actuarial stuff will work, but we all hope it does because it would be good to have a program um, that we don't have to bear the entire cost of um, for people to have leave in important circumstance where they, cir circumstances where they need it. We do not have any guidance yet how healthy families and workplaces paid sick leave is going to integrate with health, um, uh, family leave, family and medical leave insurance. Um, I'm sure we're going to get guidance on that after 2023 gets started so that we know what to do when 2024 rolls around. So stay tuned. Um, but these are things that you do need to pay attention to because they're going to change throughout the course of the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Finally, please remember that in Colorado, um, we no longer allow employers to recover vacation time from folks when they leave employment. Vacation time can no longer be forfeited. And whether you call it vacation or paid time off, doesn't matter. Once you have awarded it to the employee, you can't reel it back in. You have to pay it in cash when they leave employment. It didn't used to be the case. You could have a vacation program where they could only accrue so much per year. And if they didn't use it, they lost it and they started over the next year. Those won't work anymore. Instead, what you do is you put a cap on the total amount that anybody can accrue at any one time, after which they just don't accrue anymore until they've used some of it. It sounds like a technical difference. It is, but it's an important one because we've had employers get in trouble for not knowing that they could not have a use it or lose it vacation program anymore. And that's a relatively recent thing in Colorado law. Now, lastly, labor organizing, I'm just gonna tell you this, um, you are not familiar with the Colorado Labor Peace Act. I can tell you that very few people are. For agriculture only, you only have to have one employee to become subject to collective bargaining, which sounds kind of stupid and it is. Everybody else has to eight, have eight employees before they become subject to it but that's not the way it works for you all. Um, that was part of SB 87. If you see any indication of union activity, like farm worker justice organizations or things of that sort, you see flyers around from the United Farm, farm Workers or from another union for that matter, like the United Fruit and Commercial Workers. Do not stop PASCO, do not collect $200, call for help. You can call us, you can call Zach and Brittany, 
don't try to do this alone. If you see any evidence that there is organizing activity on your farm, you're gonna need help. Labor law is complicated. It is not something that you know intuitively and you need to get on it early in order not to make big mistakes that could really cost you a lot of money. With that, I will ask Cindy, are there any other um, questions in the chat that I need to address before we say sayonara here? I think I've got us caught up. Terrific. Well, thank you very much for handling that. I know the folks appreciate it. Um, uh, again, I'd just like to say to everybody, thank you for inviting us <clears throat> to spend time with you today. I know this stuff isn't easy to deal with, especially when the le legislation that was adopted was kind of like somebody opening up a fire hydrant and just letting it all come out all at once. Um, I will say that the team uh, lobbying for you, and I was just a teeny tiny little part of it, your, your lobbyists, um, did a heck of a good job in doing everything possible to try to blunt the blow of this. Um, it still came out pretty bad and it wasn't their fault. Um, please do do your best to comply with these new requirements. I really, really, really would rather spend five minutes on the phone keeping you out of trouble than five days in court getting you out of trouble once you get there. So it's a great privilege to get to work with the association and we look forward to the next time we get to visit with you. Take care. All right, thank you, Kevin. And thank you for everyone for the lively question uh, discussion going on in the chat. We're trying to capture all of those on our end to make sure that nothing gets missed. And hopefully Cindy was able to catch some of that as well. Uh, I'm sure Kevin won't mind if we forward him some questions after the fact, uh, but he may charge you twice by the hour. No, I'm just totally kidding, but... Uh, Big now, thank now. you. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, really, Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, uh, this is invaluable information, and um, you don't know how many text messages I've fielded through this whole thing going, we're recording this. Are we going to break this down? Is this something that we can ask more questions on? So Yes. It, well, really I'll great come back. You, you tell me anytime that the members can tolerate putting up with a lawyer for an hour straight without a break, and I'll be glad to come back to, to help you out. Hey, you're the only uh, not lawyerly lawyer I've ever worked with. So we really appreciate having you as an ally and uh, having you on the team. So um, anybody else, any more questions, anything uh, burning desire going once? Well, big thank you to Clay uh, again. We couldn't have done it without you all and your team, uh, you are, what makes us these things happen. We're gonna be doing the fourth and final one of these uh, events next week in person. Be watching your email for additional information. Uh, we're gonna have Dr. Maggie Baldwin out to talk about some animal health issues around the state and things uh, that should concern you um, as far as dealing with your on-farm operations. We're also gonna be hosting that uh, in person, and it will include a free lunch on us and uh, a safety training. So if you're not all caught up on your safety training, uh, as it concerns the workers' comp safety group, please, this could be the last one of the season. Um, hopefully we don't have to do an emergency one Christmas Eve for those that just remembered they need their safety training. But um, we will be getting a the rest of this information shared with you all shortly. I'm gonna kick it back over to the team here right now and uh, ask Brittany to close us out. Thank you guys so much. And I hope everyone has a great week. Thanks, Zach. Yes, everyone, I know I've seen your chats. We will have the recording of the meeting today, the webinar up on our YouTube channel. So if everybody wants to go there for that, that would be greatly appreciated and share it with anybody you know that might need the information. It was a really invaluable um, time here that we had. And then also all of the links such as a flyer from American National and the PowerPoint and any other important details will be sent via email. So be on the lookout for that email as well. But if you guys have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us here at CLA. And we thank you for your participation today. We'll see you all soon. Thanks so much.